Speaker for the hour is Shane Robinson. Shane is the preacher for the Chickamauga Church of Christ, Chickamauga, Georgia, where he is doing a good work. Uh, he is married to Jennifer, and they have four children, and they are also raising um, a nephew. So he's got five kids that he is uh, raising up here, of course, to love God, to love others. And Shane is, in fact, a graduate of the East Tennessee School of Preaching back in 2006. Um, I got to call him to invite him here to speak. I really appreciate Shane. Uh, one of the things, one of the aspects about Shane that I appreciate is he realizes that we live in a we live in a pretty visual world, and so a lot of the graphics and the things that he would, he often does in connection with his sermons and planning his sermons are always top notch, and uh, and the material he produces always just looks very good and professional. Uh, I really appreciate Shane, and I know you'll appreciate his message this morning as he speaks to us on a, a wonderful passage verse, John fourteen six. Where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's been estimated that 25% of the Gospel of John has to do with the end of Jesus' life, whether it be the last hours or post resurrection appearances. Much of what is said in chapters 13 through the rest of the gospel is unique to John. And thankfully, we learn about Jesus and his washing the disciples' feet. We learn about the great commandment, the new commandment. We learn so much about the Holy Spirit, about unity, about Jesus and his crucifixion. But our text, John 14, 1 through 6, is likely one of those passages that is most familiar to us. Where Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas said to him, Lord, where are you going? How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to approach our lesson today. I understand that this is Wednesday. And if you've been here all week, it is tough to process a deep lesson, right? I mean, I remember when I was here in school and other lectureships, you know, I, I get what I call mush brain. So I, I don't really want to get too heavy and technical, uh, but I want to look at this particular section of scripture, John 14, one through six, from four different perspectives, four different perspectives. And we're going to begin with the first perspective, the contextual perspective. So what's going on here? What's going on here at the end of Jesus's life where he says that his hour has come. Well, if you notice with me, John chapter 13, beginning in verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter answered and said to him, or said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. 
Peter said to him, Lord, why, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus said to him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And then Jesus goes in the next sentence in our Bible to say, let not your heart be troubled. And what's interesting about this is Jesus is indeed troubled. And the disciples are indeed confused. And as it is that Peter says that he was going to lay down his life for Jesus, the reality is, is that within 24 hours, Jesus will lay down his life for Peter. You see, he is the great shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. And within our text, John 14, 1 through 6, we notice a few things. First of all, that Jesus did not want his disciples to be troubled, but rather he wanted them to believe. Secondly, he wanted to know that he is preparing or will prepare a place for them. Thirdly, he wanted them to know that he is coming again to receive them. And fourthly, he wanted them to know and wanted the world to know that he was the only way. That through Jesus and Jesus alone would this salvation and this reunion be made possible. And so that is the context. I think that just sort of gets us up to speed of where we are in this passage, John 14, 1 through 6. It's Jesus' hour had come, chapter 13, the beginning of the chapter, that he's going to leave this world and depart to the Father. Secondly, I want to talk to you today about, I'm going to use a big word. Um, the second perspective is the soteriological perspective. Uh, the, the Greek word, uh, soter, in the family of, or the root of that has to do with being saved or delivered. And so in this passage, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. What does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you? I don't, maybe sometimes people think that Jesus is in heaven. You know, he is the uh, foreman or the supervisor of the Golden Streets uh, crew, <laughs> that, that he's there. And, you know, they are, are laying those streets of gold and he's just been preparing for, for 2,000 years. I don't believe that's what Jesus is talking about. You see, it took Jesus, God, the Spirit, all involved in that creative process, six days to build the entire universe. Are we to think that it's taking Jesus 2,000 years to prepare a way? No, friends, the way has been prepared. And we could take advantage of that right now. To think about what Jesus said and what he did for us is nothing short of amazing. I go to prepare a place for you. Turn with me in your Bibles, or hold your place there in, in John. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And what I want you to see is that the prep work was completed when Jesus was seated, okay? The prep work was completed when Jesus was seated. Now, if you're reading through the book of Hebrews, it comes to this climactic point. As it's talked about and alludes to Jesus being our high priest, chapter 2, be our sympathizing high priest, chapter 4, how he is, had to come in the order of Melchizedek and had to be born, chapters 5 through 7. How he had this earthly and this heavenly sanctuary, chapter 8, chapter 9. And then chapter 10, it all just comes to, to a climactic ending in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, 
it's through Jesus that we have direct access into the very throne of God. I don't know if we really appreciate that and understand that, in part due to our material world that we live in and, and the spiritual nature of God and his character and nature. But every time that we engage in worship, every time that we pray, we are going directly into heaven itself, where Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. And that prep work for the entire world to have access. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? What happened? The veil in the temple between the holy and most holy place was torn in two. It was torn from the top to bottom, signifying that man could not have done this, but also signifying that our way to God was now made possible through the death of Jesus. And so Jesus died, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, for every person. It's through that death that every person can have hope. So we've talked about the context. We've talked about it from the standpoint of salvation. Let's talk about third, in the third place from the eschatological, the eschatological perspective. And what am I talking about there? Well, the Greek word eschaton really has to be translated the study of final things. Sometimes eschatology has to do with what happens after we die, but also it happens to, has to do with what happens when Jesus returns. So let's talk about this phrase where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. What's he talking about? Some suggest that he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. I don't think so. Others, such as John MacArthur and other dispensationalists, say, well, this is talking about the rapture. No, that's not it either. Jesus is talking about a time that he comes, not for a brief period of time, but for a time whenever he can be with them forever. That this prep work has to take place, but he's not going to leave them alone but that he's coming back. Now, some would argue that the Gospel of John really isn't about the end of time. But there are a few subtle hints within the book itself. And if we want to determine what a word means within the Gospel of John, the best place to search is the Gospel of John. And in chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus spoke of a resurrection. Uh, not a secret resurrection, not a, a resurrection where a certain group of people will be taken and the other will be left. No, he says, do not marvel at this. The hour is coming and now is when all who are in the graves will hear my voice and come forth. And there's two groups. Those who have done well to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus is going to come again. He mentions and alludes to it in chapter uh, 14. Uh, but also in uh, the Gospel of John chapter 21, I think it is. This is, this is where I really think that, that, that what Jesus is talking about coming again is settled. Whenever he says to Peter, John 21 and verse um, 22. So J Peter is told how he's going to be betrayed, this, that. Peter, seeing the one, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? That's verse 21. And verse 22, Jesus said to him, if that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So this is not talking about a post-resurrection appearance. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about Jesus and his coming and the reunion. Now, in the last place, I want to talk quite practically. This is where I've wanted to get to. Uh, I've wanted to get to this particular section uh, the, th the fourth perspective, the practical perspective. Because there's so much here that we need to, to chew on and that we need to think about and um, that we need to truly appreciate. First of all, we have to tell others about Jesus. I, I know that's simple. But we have to tell others about Jesus. Why? Jesus says, let not your heart be what? Y'all wake this morning, let not your heart be what? Troubled. Do you think that there are people 
within this room, within this community, that have troubled hearts? And you know where they look for the answers? Within substances, within broken relationships, maybe within many different ways, recreation, and the list could go on and on, where people who are hurting, who need healing, are looking for love in all the wrong places. As Christians, we need to understand the emphatic testimony of the scriptures and never be ashamed of them. Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under, under, uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only Savior. And we must not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When I lived in Knoxville several years ago, I remember going downtown and um, seeing this bumper sticker that said, coexist. And the symbols of that word were made by various religious symbols. And we live in a society that is more and more embracing that type of ideology. That basically you have your belief, I have my belief, and we all end up in the same place. Christianity is unique. Now, it's not to say that there isn't truth, that there isn't something that, that you can learn and benefit from with other world religions. But if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, Christianity is the only religious system that addresses our problem. What's our problem? Anybody know? Sin, right? S and I am in the middle. <laughs> All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. But you know what? Jesus died for the entire world. As I reflect back in the creation story and sin in the garden, and then that first gospel sermon that was preached where the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent. And how we understand that that virgin that, John, that uh, Isaiah spoke of, uh, that Matthew alludes to in his gospel, chapter 1, that delivered that son that was both the son of Abraham and David. He was here to bless all nations through Abraham and to be king as under David. As I think about that, Jesus taking his anointing as king and his baptism, taking that triumphant entry, that inauguration into Jerusalem, but all of that was consummated when Jesus sat down at God's hand, right hand. And there's this word that the New Testament uses, propitiation is how the New King James translates it. I think that the ESV says it's the atoning sacrifice. And it depicts that time where in the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement, where that blood of the bull would be sacri uh, sacrificed and sprinkled on the mercy seat for the priest and then the lamb. You see, Jesus is our mercy seat. And it's important for us to understand that there are two paths to take in life. You know the passage, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Most people are going to take that broad way, right? But few people are the ones that are going to find it. And you know what they're going to find at the end? Life. Secondly, I want you to understand in the practical sense um, the purpose of life. What's your purpose? What's your purpose in life? The purpose of life is to live like Jesus, so one day you will live with Jesus. Chew on that. Is that not what life is all about in a nutshell? To live like Jesus, so that one day you will live with Jesus. We understand that living like Jesus is comprised of loving him, and loving him is keeping his commandments. 
but it's also living like him. When we think about the process of becoming a new creation in Christ, there is the rebirth process. We are to be reborn. Paul said in Colossians, uh, sorry, in Romans chapter 8, that there is the conform process. Our purpose in life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus, to be like Jesus, who is our example. And then there's also 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, the transformation that is to take place into his image, not of our own accord, but by the Lord. And so there is a yielding of our life in this process of faith to be like Jesus. But it's not of our own will and accord. It's not for our own purpose or endeavor, but it's for him. My life in 2003 was quite interesting. I had a good paying job, had a nice vehicle, had some pretty good drugs at the time, but there was something missing. There was something missing from my life. And in particular, what was missing from my life was a purpose in life. I remember laying in bed one night listening to a song by a band by the name of Creed entitled, What's This Life For? And I thought about, well, what is this life for? And I remembered my grandfather was a gospel preacher and growing up, my parents never were on the same page a lot of times religiously. So we were basically people who only went on Mother's Day or Christmas or something like that. But I had enough knowledge of God and a great godly example of my grandparents that I knew that Maybe I should give this God thing a try. And it wasn't too long after that that I was married, baptized the same day, April 10th, 2013. It wasn't too long after that that I read a book by John Waddy called Preaching to Preachers About Preaching. And then I got the opportunity to preach, I guess, about four or five months after obeying the gospel. What a crazy thought that was. But I got excited about it. And I worked with this guy and I'm from North Georgia, and people are kind of funny around them neck of the woods. <laughs> but he said, he said, Shane, if you want to be a preacher, you, you better be called. You got to be called to be a preacher. And I said, well, finally, I said, well, what's that mean? <laughs> am, I, am I listening for God? And he said, no. If you can't read the Bible without having a burning desire to share it with others, you're not called. And I said, well, I guess I can agree with that. Because every time I open my Bible and I read it, I want to share it with others. And I share that story for you to say that life has a purpose. As I drove up this morning, I listened to the Gospel of John, and I found it was interesting that trust and belief is repeated. Life and everlasting life is repeated through this. And I think about this. Jesus, the purpose of John's Gospel is that we may believe but that believing you may have what? Y'all tell me the word. Life, everlasting life in his name. In John chapter 10, he is the chief shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. But he says that I have come that you may have a, an abundant life. And sometimes we think about that abundant life as being something that is in the hereafter. But I'm here to tell you, uh, brethren, you can have that full and abundant life now. It's important for you to enjoy the blessings of God. You see, there's a passage in Colossians chapter 3 that it's always been interesting to me. It says that when Christ, who is our life, appears. There are so many different functional saviors out there that have all these promises to bring you joy, to bring you comfort, but they'll never satisfy They'll end up in a place like that rich guy in Luke chapter 12 that says, you know, no, I'm going to build some barns. I'm going to fill them up and I'm going to have this day in my life that once I get all that prep work done, I'm going to kick my feet back. I'm going to eat, drink and be merry. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You're a fool. Why? Because this night your soul will be required of you and then, well, whose will these things be? We've got to tell other people about Jesus. And we have to understand that when it comes to Jesus, 
that the purpose of this life, you've heard it said before, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. But the purpose of life is to live like Jesus so that one day we will live with Jesus. And that's the third area that I wanted to share with you in the lesson is yours. You're not up here to kick me out, are you? Okay. It's not about when and it's not about where, but it's about who. It's not about when, it's not about where, but it's about who. We talked about that big word, eschatology, final things. This has always been an area of debate. I think that one of the reasons is, is we haven't experienced it. You know, we can argue about what, what happens when someone dies. And I've sat there at the bedside of people who have taken their last breath. And I would assume that many of you here have as well. And it's, maybe it's morbid of me, but the first thing that comes to my mind is, is well, now they know. <laughs> now they know what life is going to be like on the other side. And so often it is, we get so caught up in the wind. Remember in 2012, that guy, Harold Campen, that said the end of time? You know, in 2020, I had to deal with this. You know, if the, the end is near, the end is near. People get so caught up on the wind. I'm going to share something with you. This might be helpful. I stole this in a message that I heard several years ago by Alistair Begg. When it comes to end times discussion, there's an important factor. It's important to keep the plain things the main things, and the main things, the plain things. Let me say that again. It's important to keep the plain things, the main things, and the main things, the plain things. I had Rod Rutherford for Revelation, not, re not Revelations, okay, <laughs> it's Revelation. I had him in Revelation several years ago. I, I tell you, the first three chapters are gravy. <laughs> And then chapter 4, Revelation hits, and it's just like, whoa, what am I getting myself into? And oftentimes people go to Matthew 24, to Revelation, or to some uh, apocalyptic literature such as Ezekiel, and that's where they make their bread and butter passages. That's where they get this doctrine and how they get on these different things and say, well, here's the end is time, the, the, the end is near, this, that, and the other. Matthew 24 has some pretty main things. Beginning in verse 36 of the end chapter, guess what? Nobody knows. Nobody knows, but there is something that we need to know. Watch, therefore, and be ready. For you do not know an hour that your Lord is coming. That's pretty plain to me. It's not about where. There has been debate in recent years concerning the end of time and what will take place. I know that there was a uh, a friendly discussion, I think it was at Harding University a couple of years ago with Ralph Gilmore and Dan Chambers. I know both brothers. Uh, Dan, I met Dan here, as a matter of fact, whenever he was at Maryville when I was here in Knoxville. Uh, his parents uh, go to a church, his dad's an elder, his brother's an elder of the church in Chattanooga near where I preach, all salt of the earth people. And they had a brotherly discussion about the end of time and what their view is whether or not it would be a renewed creation or whether or not it would be as commonly we have, I guess in the last um, seven decades, seven or eight decades, that we go to heaven. I'm not here to get into that debate, but I am here to, sh to, to share something with you that I think is helpful and important. Uh, well, I believe that we should have, be able to have brotherly discussions over things and inter interpretations and have that spirit of unity. But I want you to see something that... I think is important. The point that I'm getting at is it's not when, it's not where, it's not even really how, but it's about who. In our text, John chapter 14, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Where is that? It's where Jesus is. What about, I, I used to do a, a television program in Chattanooga for about 10 years, did two of them, and uh, one of the questions that we would get from time to time is, how do we know that Jesus isn't coming back to earth? And I have my sugar stick passage that I turn to, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. You know, 
Now the Lord's going to descend. Those who are dead in Christ are going to be called up. And they're going to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, I remember one day reading that passage again and thinking, I don't think that's my interpretation was correct. Because if that's the case, does that mean that we're just going to levitate in the air for all eternity? Listen, it's not about when, it's not about where, it's about who. If Jesus is our life, if we have taken advantage of that way that he made possible, and we have trusted in him with full, active, obedient faith throughout our lives, one day he's going to come again. And somehow every eye is going to see him, whether it be noon or night as we commonly see. But there's going to be a great resurrection. You see, right now Jesus is your advocate. If you're a child of God, he's your mediator. But when he returns, he's going to be your judge. And we will stand before him to give an account of the things done in the body, whether they be good or evil. And what's most important for us today is to live like Jesus, that one day we may live with Jesus and be with the one to whom died for us for all eternity. Thank you. I had a good PowerPoint, but, but Jacob, he, he deleted the file. And uh, no, I'm just messing with you. <laughs>